to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. God is good. We're going to have a good time in the word of the Lord today. Listen, you didn't come today to hear from a man or a woman, the young, the old, the black, the brown, the white, or any other color. This is about us coming together and hearing from the voice of the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church, the Bible says. So if you have the ability, would you stand to your feet? I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord together today in prayer. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful that we get to come into the house of God. We get to come into your presence And God, we just want to come and hear your voice. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. We pray, Lord, that you give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, even the instruction, the correction that we need for each and every one of our individual lives, God. Lord, we didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, the young or the old, God, any man or anybody, God, the ideas and philosophies of man. We came to hear from you. So as we open up your word today, Lord, we pray that you open it up to us. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Open up our hearts to have a good understanding. May we hear the word of God. May it be seed sown into good ground. Lord, we give you our promise. God, we'll give our interest to all attention. God, we will diligently adhere to what it is that you have for us today, God. And we know that you'll do your part, God, causing that natural effort that we put in to become supernatural by your grace and your empowering. Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, there are brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. So God bless all of our brothers and sisters, our Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. We thank you for Calvary Chapel and Harvest and Oak Valley and Inland, the way, God. We thank you, Lord, for the well. We thank you, Father God, for Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia, God. Bless all the churches, God. We thank you, Lord, that you bless the assemblies, God, and the four square denominations, our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord, all those who are naming Jesus as Lord and proclaiming his gospel. Pray that you would bless them and be amongst them as you are amongst us. Jesus mighty name we're all in agreement we say Amen. Amen. you can have a seat and get your Bible out go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 6 today we're coming in for a landing the last verse of Hebrews chapter 6 we're gonna be in verse number 20 continuing our thoughts from last time we were together in the book of Hebrews pastor Luke preached a brilliant message about the anchor of our hope today we're gonna continue those thoughts talking about how Jesus entered the presence that that anchor goes into the presence of God behind the veil to the most holy place in the heaven itself Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 20 continues that thought. And it says, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you remember, let me rewind your thinking a couple years back when we were in Hebrews chapter 5. Okay, Hebrews chapter 5 started to talk about how Jesus was made a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And we said, hey, hold tight on that thought. Just kind of put that on the shelf for a minute. We're going to come back to that when we get to Hebrews chapter 7. So this verse starts to introduce that concept of Jesus as high priest, as well as the order of Melchizedek once again. But we're not going to get into that today. we got plenty of time to discuss that at length in Hebrews chapter 7, 8, and 9. We'll be discussing the high priest. We'll be discussing the order of Melchizedek and what that means about Jesus, as well as what that means to our lives. Today, I want to narrow into the first part of that verse. Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 20. Let's read it again. It says, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. Today, I want to talk to you about the forerunner. The forerunner. Now, for most of us in this room, if we were to say, what is a forerunner? You would say, well, that's a Toyota truck that, you know, is an SUV that people drive, you know. And that's kind of the extent of our knowledge of the forerunner. And yet, God has called Jesus the forerunner. He has entered for us. He's gone and done something on our behalf. He is the forerunner. In biblical times, you would find that a forerunner is somebody who went ahead. He was a scout or maybe even a spy. He would go in and he would take a look around, see what was going on, find out the strengths, find out the weaknesses, uh, give recommendations. As the army would come behind him, he would come back and would report back and say, this is what we need to do. This is the, the stronghold. This is the weak point. We could probably blast through this wall here, get in and take care of what we need to take care of. Additionally, a forerunner may have been somebody who was a part of the army that when the army had a victory and they were going to return to their homeland, the forerunner would run out ahead of the army and he would go back to their homeland and he would declare that we have the victory we've overcome and now the reigning army is coming back, bringing back the spoils of war. Now that's what Jesus is 
for us. Jesus has gone out ahead of us. And yet, when Jesus won the victory, no one greater could go before him to declare his victory. He himself was our forerunner. He himself went into heaven. He himself declared his victory. He himself poured out his blood on the mercy seat and said, I have overcome. And he sat down at the right hand of God, opening the way for us to go to heaven. Amen. See, that's our Jesus. He has gone out ahead of us. Our forerunner, Jesus, announces our future arrival in heaven into the very presence of God. His footsteps will be followed and all of heaven waits in expectation. The Bible says that we're going to have a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our God. The Bible declares that even angels desire to look into the things of salvation. The Bible says that there's a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, cheering us on, waiting for us, and that Jesus, in expectation, earnestly awaits our arrival and makes intercession on our behalf in the meantime. See, all of heaven is waiting. Why? Because our forerunner Jesus has gone before us, declared his victory, and now he awaits our arrival when the saints go marching in, if I can use that expression. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, it's one thing to know about that. We all can stop right here and say, that's great. That is wonderful. I love that understanding of Jesus. I learned something today. Don't I feel good about myself? Walk out of this place and live life the same. Live life defeated. Live life wondering how we're going to get through, how we're going to make it, how we're going to deal with the problems, the issues, the pressures of life. See, because Jesus is our forerunner, it changes things. Changes the way that we live. Changes the world that we live in. But if you don't understand how it changes things, you'll never operate in the way that the Lord would have you to, to do what God has called you to do and be all that God has called you to be. So today I want to discuss, because Jesus is our foreigner, what's it do? What does it mean? How does it affect our life? A couple of areas that we're going to take a look at today that I believe as you get a hold of these will change the world that you live in. Are you listening today? Because Jesus is our foreigner, number one, his path is our path. Because Jesus is our foreigner, his path is our path. In other words, we run on his course. Jesus went ahead of us. He goes out in front of us, and now we are following in his footsteps. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, the word of God says that a disciple is a disciplined follower. We are following him. We are walking in his ways. We are going on his path. Uh, just the other day, uh, my wife and I went with Pastor Luke and Stacy, and, and we had our, our little guys with us. I have a little son named Titus. He has a little son named Bjorn. And so we were going out there and walking through uh, the woods. And as we were going through, we would encounter little streams, little rivers, and things like that. And what do we do as good daddies, right? We walk out, and we, we step on the rocks. We make sure that they're okay. And we step, and we wiggle around and make sure that as we cross that river or that stream, that when the little guy comes, we say, put your feet where my feet were, son. And you'll be okay. You're going to make it to the other side. All you got to do is follow me. See, in the same way Jesus went out ahead of us, he went before us. He has lived a life, the perfect, spotless, sinless life. He came and he robed himself in flesh. He was all God and he was all man. And now because he has robed himself in flesh and gone out before us, he was tempted as we are yet without sin. He knows how to overcome. He knows the solid places to put our feet. And he says, if you just follow in my footsteps, put your feet where my feet were, do the things that you see me doing, you will make it to the other side. See, Jesus is our forerunner. He went out ahead of us. The road that Jesus walked is marked with suffering and sacrifice. Think about it. That was the path that Jesus walked. The Bible tells us he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. As he went about this life, it was difficult. It wasn't easy for Jesus. He had to endure. The Bible says he had to learn obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus was beaten. Jesus was mocked. Jesus wasn't popular. Jesus was popular in certain ways, and there is, yes. But at the end of his life, when he's hanging on the cross, here's his mother and a couple other people, one of his disciples there. Everybody was scattered. Everybody had left. And now here he was alone on the cross. See, Jesus' life was a life that was marked with suffering and sacrifice, and yet Jesus overcame. Jesus is now on the other side beckoning us and saying, yeah, life can be tough. Yes, life can be hard, but son, daughter, put your feet where my feet were, and you're going to make it out. All right. Are you listening today? 
I think of it in, in terms sometimes, I don't know how many movie buffs we got out there, you like movies and things like that. You remember Indiana Jones, okay, and, and, and here he is, he's going for that golden statue head thingy, right? And as he's going through, he's being very careful about why, where he puts his feet. Why? Because if he puts his foot on the wrong one, right, here comes the spear, here comes all the booby traps and all that kind of stuff. And so he's got to be very careful. He, he, he's going after it. He's following a path that was difficult. What about some of the newer movies, right? The, the spy movies or maybe, maybe this, the heist movie where they're going to go and they're going to steal a painting or something like that. And what do they do? They get into this long hallway. You know the scene that I'm talking about. And, and they spray the mist. Right? And why do they do that? Because as they spray that mist across the hallway, all of a sudden you can see all the lasers and, and, and all the, the stuff that if they put their foot in the wrong place or, or maybe if their coat or their, their thing slips out just enough, it'll hit that laser and the alarms will go off and, and they'd lose, right? So what do they do? The first person goes out and they do backflips and, and they have to like move all around, you know, and they do the robot and the funky chicken as they get across. And then they turn around and they say, it was easy. Come on, you can do it too. The other person on the other side, like, I, I can't do that. I just give up. You just go ahead, right? So we see that in our lives. The Bible talks about Jesus as the forerunner. Running is a, a big theme in the Bible. If you take a look at it, you see that runners in a race exert themselves. It's tough. They strive hard. They spend their strength in attaining a win. They're disciplined in life. We have to be the same way with the word of God. So we see the word about running occurring in the Greek writings. It denoted experiencing severe peril that required extreme effort to overcome. Severe peril that required extreme effort to overcome. Sometimes in life, you may be feeling like that person going through all of that stuff and doing all the different poses and it's tough, it's hard, you don't know what to expect and you're worried and frustrated and, and trying to grope about and find out what is it that God is doing. But Jesus says, follow me, watch after me, put your feet where my feet were, follow my path. It may be tough and may be hard and may be marked with sacrifice and suffering, but you can do it church, you can overcome because I have overcome. You're there in Hebrews, turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He tells them he's going to go and suffer. He's going to be crucified, hung on a cross. Peter starts to rebuke him. No, Jesus, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen, Jesus. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have in mind the things of God. You're defense to me. Right? Turns it back around and don't rebuke me, I'll rebuke you. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 24, Jesus goes on speaking and he says these words. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, remember these are the disciplined followers. Not just to the 12 guys with him. No, this is to us today. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. See, if we're going to follow Jesus, if his path is now our path, Jesus had to take up his own cross. Each and every one of us have a cross with our name on it. It's a cross that we are to take up and we are to follow in his footsteps. We're to go where he, he went and do what he did, giving up even our lives. There was a pastor in Germany by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a pastor and a leader in a, in a movement there in Germany, Christian movement, started a, a denomination, if you will. And he was there during the time of the Nazis in World War II. In fact, he even started to work against the Nazis and became a spy and was actively involved in one of the plots to kill Hitler. He said these words, and I want you to listen to them, from a pastor in Germany who gave his life for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the church died a couple of months before the Allies came into Germany and declared the freedom. Says this, says salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. Salvation is free, yeah, it's the free gift of God to all men, but discipleship, following Jesus, will cost you your life. Why? Because His path is our path. His path was a road marked with suffering, marked with sacrifice. He gave His life on the cross. Now our path is marked with suffering, and sacrifice. Now, it's getting quiet in this church, but I got good news for you because that's just number one. As we go, it's going to get gooder and gooder because not only is his path our path, but because Jesus is our forerunner, number two, his destination is our destination. 
In other words, if you take a look at a map and you see where Jesus went, if you follow that path, you're going to end up where he went. And where is Jesus presently? He's in heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father. That means if you're following in Jesus' footsteps, you're going to end up where Jesus ended up. That means, church, you're not going to hell. If you're following Jesus, you're going to heaven. We can rejoice every day. Doesn't matter what happens here on earth. Doesn't matter. Take away my stuff. Take away my life. I don't care. I'm following Jesus. You can do what you want. Because why? I'm going to heaven. You can't get me off that course. Following him. A.R. Fawcett said these words. He said, Christ's ascension is our promotion. And where the glory of the head has proceeded, there the hope of the body too is called. Where Jesus went, that's where we're going. If Jesus is in heaven, we're going to heaven. If Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, hey, we're going to have a seat prepared for us right there. My goodness. You're there in the book of Matthew. Turn with me to the Old Testament. Now we're going to kind of ping pong back and forth a little bit, Old and New Testament. Turn with me to the book of Ruth. Past the first five books of the Bible find Joshua, Judges, then you find a little book called Ruth. Now, Ruth is a great read. If you, if you like novels and things like that, you like a good story, romance, that sort of a thing, little four-chapter book called Ruth. We're going to go to Ruth chapter number one. Now, Ruth was an unusual person. Ruth was from the land of Moab. She had a mother-in-law by the name of Naomi. Now, Ruth was married to Naomi's son, and there was another Moabite girl that was married to Naomi's other son, okay? And they lived in the land of Moab because there was a famine, so uh, Naomi had taken her sons down. Her husband had died, and so here they are in Moab looking for provision. Her sons get married. They start to live life. Well, both of her sons die. And so she tells her daughters, I, I'm just filled with bitterness, and you guys need to leave me alone. I'm going to go back to Israel. There's nothing for me here. It's just bitterness here. And so girls, go ahead and go back to your families. Go back to your father and mother. Now, one of the daughters says, okay, love you. See you later. You know, and she takes off. But this little Moabite woman by the name of Ruth, she says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. No, you're not going to send me away like that. Let's read her words. Let's read what she says. Let's hear her heart and her passion as she speaks to her mother-in-law who she loves. R Ruth chapter number one, verse number 16. Ruth chapter number one, verse number 16. Look at what it says. It says, but Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. What does that mean? Don't tell me to go away or to turn back from following after you. Now look at her oath. Look at her vow to her mother-in-law. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. That's quite a statement. Maybe you don't realize the impact of that statement. What she was saying is, I no longer care about my upbringing, my past, my people, or the gods of my people, lowercase g. Because in those times, all the nations had different gods. And they were not following the one true God. They didn't know about God Almighty. They had their worship. They worshiped the trees. They worshiped the moon. They worshiped the stars. They worshiped the sun. And really these were demonic spirits that were behind all these things that they were worshiping. And she says to her mother-in-law, she says, I, don't tell me to stop following you. I'm going wherever you're going. I'm going to make your path my path. That means, Naomi, your destination is my destination. In doing that, she forsook her people her heritage, her upbringing, and she sealed her fate in Israel. She was going to end up in Israel. She became one of the people of Israel. And she says, not only that, your people shall be my people. I, I no longer have a family here. You're my family. Those are my people now. But look at what she says at the end. And your God shall be my God. Amen. See, in doing so, God took notice of what this little lady Ruth was saying and what she was doing, saw the heart. And because of this, we find out that she met a man by the name of Boaz, who was a, a, a close relative of her mother-in-law, Naomi. And Boaz was a good man. Boaz owned a lot of land. Boaz was, was reaping a harvest. And as he was reaping, he saw this little Moabite woman. He said, hey, you guys, be nice to her. You know what? As, as you're treading the grain, let her reap behind you. Don't, don't rebuke her. Don't, don't tell her anything. Let a little, little grain fall behind you. You know, let, give, give her a little, throw a little bone, you know. And he took care of her. And he ends up marrying her. And she becomes the grandmother, the great-grandmother of a guy by the name of David. You know him as King David. 
Wow. Now, if that wasn't enough, we know that in the lineage of David comes Jesus, the Messiah. See, when Ruth said, your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God, it put her in a position of not only forsaking the ways and becoming a new nation, but now she becomes the grandmother of this king, David, and also here she is in the line of Jesus himself. And more importantly for her, she ended up going to heaven and not going to hell. Are you listening? You're there, and Ruth, turn back with me to the New Testament to the book of John. The book of John, Jesus is speaking. Once again, he's talking about the road's tough. Things are going to happen. You're not going to like it. He tells his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 1, don't be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. John chapter 14, verse number 2 and 3, though, goes on. Jesus starts speaking about the destination. John chapter 14, verse 2, he says these words. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. Some of your translations say many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Remember, Jesus is the forerunner. Bible says he entered the presence behind the veil for us. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Now look at the next verse. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Here's the point. That where I am, there you may be also. See, Jesus didn't get us saved, headed for heaven just to be in heaven, and we just show up there and then we're kind of hanging out with other people, the angels, playing a harp on the clouds, that sort of a thing. If you remember the old cartoons and stuff that pictured heaven that way. That is not what heaven is about. Heaven is about us following the path of Jesus, ending up at the destination where Jesus is. God says, I will be their God. They shall be my people. If you look at the book of Revelation, there in the new Jerusalem, the Lamb is its light. Now God dwells amongst his people. That means that for all of eternity, what are we going to be doing? We're going to be with Jesus. We're going to be hanging out with Jesus. We're going to be leaning up against Jesus. We're going to be sitting at the feet of Jesus. We're going to be listening to Jesus. That's what this is all about. Ending up where he is. I'm going to be following him around like a lost puppy dog. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. And I'm not getting saved just to go to heaven. I got saved so that I could be with him. He is our destination. Oh, but like I said, it just keeps getting better and better as we go along. Because Jesus is our forerunner. What happens? Well, number one, his path becomes our path. Number two, his destination becomes our destination. Finally, number three, what he has, we have. See, up until now, we've been talking about kind of future, kind of things ahead, the road, the destination. But right now, right where you live, right now. In the midst of your life, right now. In the face of your troubles, right now. What he has, we have. Why? Because he's our forerunner. He went on ahead of us. And now we have said yes to Jesus. We have joined ourselves to him. He has joined himself to us. We are now in covenant. You remember that word that we talked about? Now my life is completely his because we're in covenant. It's the most closest, solemn, sacred, most binding agreement, the closest of all contracts. Now I have agreed to him. And now everything that I am, everything that I have, everything that I ever will be or ever will have, it's all his. The Bible says that we have been bought with a price. Now we are no longer our own. You don't have a choice anymore to go and do those old things. Why? Because you've been bought. You have been redeemed. And now you don't have that choice. You're not your own. You can't make that choice anymore. Your life is God's. God claims right by the blood of Jesus to your life. Now sometimes we say, well, why is God picking on me? I want to just go have fun. I want to do my thing. No, you've been bought with the price. Now everything you have is his. But on the opposite side of that too, everything he has is yours. That means that all of the resource of heaven is yours. All of the strength of Almighty God 
is yours. All of the wisdom of the all-knowing God is yours. All of the power of the Almighty God is yours. All of the comfort of the comfort of the Holy Spirit is yours. Everything that He has is yours. Because you're in covenant. My goodness. Changes the world that you live in. Because now you don't have to go to God in prayer and say, God, I hope that you maybe will drop a little blessing raindrop on me. Maybe I'll make it. Maybe I won't. God, it's your will. Maybe, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can know your will, God. Listen, the Bible says it's God's good pleasure to bestow on you not just a little blessing, but a kingdom. The entire thing. He's pouring it all out on you. It's all yours. It's all available. So when you go into the presence of God, you say, God, I have a need. Get out our checkbook. God, I, I, I have a struggle. Get out our strength. God, I, there's a fight ahead of me. There's a battle I'm going through. God, you said vengeance is mine, says the Lord. God, you said the battle is mine, declares the Lord. Therefore, God, let's go up against our enemies together. You don't go out by yourself. God goes before you. God is the God who can open doors no man can close and closes doors no man can open. God is moving on your behalf. You've got to get in there in faith. Declaring and believing the word of God. You sick in your body. You don't put up with that. Oh no. Jesus went to the cross. That was his path. And even though you may have sickness, you say no. No, 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 no. Jesus went to the cross and by his stripes, I was healed. That's what this is all about. A great story in the Old Testament. Turn to me to the book of Judges. Right before the book of Ruth, where you just were. The book of Judges. The book of Judges, we find... A story going on. I, I want to set the stage for you as you turn in there. Judges chapter 11. Judges chapter number 11. Now the children of Israel, when they were going into the land, the promised land, they had to take a journey through the wilderness and they were coming up through different lands and there was territories of other kingdoms, other nations. Now they knew that those kingdoms and those nations were not theirs. God had given them to other nations. So here they come to the border of a territory of a, a nation called the Ammonites. Okay, Ammon. All right, and here they come to the edge of the territory, and they send word to the king. His name is Sihon. Okay? So they say, King Sihon, we want to pass through your land. We'd like to just walk through. We're not going to touch anything. We're not going to eat anything. We're not going to take anything. We're not even going to drink a little cup of water. We're just going to walk through on the way to our land that God has given us. We know this is your land. We know that God has given it to you. Therefore, we've got no beef. If I can use present-day San Bernardino terminology, the technical term, we've got no beef. Okay? And so they say, we don't have any problems with you. So we're just going to walk through. Now, the king, Sihon, says, no, I'm not going to let you walk through. I don't like you. In fact, he gathers all of his army and goes out against them to fight them, right? Wages war against them. Now, God delivers Sihon and all of his people into the hands of the children of Israel. Now, the fact that they defeated Sihon, the king, and all of the people meant that that land now, because of their victory, had become theirs. It is part of the spoils of war was their territory. So they own it and they occupy it. Now, fast forward 300 years into the future. 300 years into the future, the children of Israel are in this cycle. They serve God, then they don't serve God. God raises up a judge, a deliverer for them. They, they serve God while the judge is alive, then the judge dies. They forget about God, and then they go back to doing their own thing. Now, the king of the Amorites comes to them, and he says, Hey, I want my land. You guys took our land. That wasn't right. Give it back. Now, the children of Israel start shaking in their boots. They say, We don't have any leader. We don't have anyone that could go to the war. But then they thought, Oh, wait, there's this one guy that we were really mean to a while back. He was the son of a prostitute. And so we kicked him out, and worthless men gathered to him in the wilderness, and he's been going out raiding. He knows something about war. And so they go and they get this guy by the name of Jephthah, okay? Now, Jephthah's like, what are you guys coming to me for? Are you serious? You know, you kick me out and then you want me to be your leader? And they say, we're going to serve you. We're going to do what you say. He says, okay, let's do it. So he goes and he goes and he talks to the king. And I want you to read what he says to the king. He says, basically, in a nutshell, I'll give you kind of a brief overview. He says, what have you guys been doing for the past 300 years? If you had any claim to the land, you should have got it between now and then. But you didn't. And listen to his response to the king in Judges chapter number 11. Jephthah is speaking. Judges chapter 11, verse number 23. Talking about what he has, we have our forerunner Jesus. Take a look at it with these eyes. Judges chapter 11, verse 23, and verse number 24. Judges chapter 11, verse 23 says this. And now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. Should you then possess it? 
Verse 24, will you not possess whatever Shemosh, your God, gives you to possess? Remember, these nations served other gods. So he says, you take whatever your God gives you. You don't have to possess our land. That's our land. You possess what your God gives you. Now look at the rest of the verse. Verse 24, last part of it says this. So whatever the Lord our God takes possession of before us, we will possess. Now I want you to think about Jesus for a moment. I want you to think about our forerunner. Christ fought the battle and overcame for us. Christ won the victory. The Bible says that when he went to the cross, that he made a public spectacle of the powers and the principalities, that he disrobed them, he disarmed them, that he took back the keys of the kingdom of God, and he ascended on high, and he led captives in his train, and he declared his victory to spirits in bondage, and they went to the most holy place in the presence of God for us on our behalf, and he poured out his blood on the mercy seat, opening the way for us to inherit the kingdom of God. And now... We have the victory of Christ in us. We have the Spirit of God in us. We have the kingdom of God in us. We have the resource of God in us. We have all the power of God, the Godhead in His fullness in Jesus Christ. Now Christ in us, the hope of glory. Whatever He possesses before us, that we will possess. We're in Him, He's in us. Whatever He has, we have. We show this to you in the New Testament. Last verse for today. Ephesians chapter 1. Turn there with me. Turn there with me. Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. Great verse. Great verse. Verse number 3. This is where we live today. This is New Testament. Present day. Jesus has gone to the cross. He's ascended on high. He's seated at the right hand of God. Spirit's been given. Now the church, body of Christ, is living. And here are the words the Lord to us today. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at the past tense words. Who has blessed us with a little bit? Blessed us with some? Blessed us with just what we need for for ourselves. Oh, I'm sorry. Blessed us with what? Oh, come on. That was, that was like a quarter of you guys. Let's everybody get involved. Bless us with what? Everything. Oh, that was about half. Let's get the rest of you. Wake yourself up. Shake yourself right now. He has blessed us with what? Everything. Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You say, well, if it's in heavenly places, what good is that doing me here on the earth? Here's what good it's doing you here on the earth. It's yours. You own it. You have it. You just have to reach out by faith and start to take hold of the promise of God. You say, how do I do that? Here's how you do it. You start to declare the word of God. Speak the word of God. Believe the word of God. And by faith, you grab a hold of it with your tongue, with your mouth. And you say, by his stripes, I was healed. He is my God. He shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You say, I have the peace of God, the comfort of God, the power of God. I have the wisdom of God and the mind of Christ living on the inside of me. I live the life of of God, I follow Him in His steps, in His ways. I'm an overcomer. I'm more than a conqueror. God is greater in me than he that is in the world. See, you reach out by faith, declaring the Word of God, and then God brings it into the natural in your life. What He has, we have. Today, what did we learn? We learned about the forerunner, Jesus. Because He is our forerunner, number one, His path is our path. Yes, it's a road marked with suffering and sacrifice, but that's okay because we see our end. His destination, number two, is our destination. Finally, number three, what he has, we have here and now. Promises of God are yes and amen in him. If you got something for the word of the Lord today, come on, give God a great big praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. You got good? I want to thank you guys for staying put. Lots of people got up already. If you, you can hear the sound of my voice, I want you guys to stay put because God wants to speak to you too, right where you're at, there in the foyer, out there in the breezeways on the way to your car. Hey, stop, take a bench. There's one right next to you. Go sit down. Listen to what God's going to speak to you. In the restrooms. Hello. <laughs> Finish what you're doing. Come out in the foyer and listen up. <laughs> Praise God. You guys have been great today. I want to thank you guys for staying. And thank you guys for listening to the word of God. I really do believe you got something from the word. Well, this is not enough to know about the path. Not enough to know about the destination. Not enough to know about what he has. 
If you're not right with God, none of it works. You're on the wrong path. Contrary to what popular belief says, there's a, a lie out there. We've been fed this lie that all roads lead to heaven. It doesn't work. Not all roads lead to heaven. I think God just leaves it up to whatever we want to do. You just live however you want to live. You'll end up in heaven. It doesn't work like that. If that's the case, then why did Jesus go to the cross at all? If everybody was going to make it anyways. But it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Jesus came and he said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means we can't get there your way or my way or someone meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. God doesn't say that being good or going to church, getting involved in volunteering or helping out, it's going to get you into heaven. In fact, this will blow your mind. God didn't even say knowing who he is or being able to quote scriptures or celebrate Christmas or Easter gets you into heaven. How do I know that? Because demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures. He's not a Christian. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about your mental ascent towards God. It's not about your good works or your goodness, your upbringing. It doesn't matter if your parents took you to church, raised you as a Christian, quote unquote, born in America, the quote unquote Christian nation. Listen, God's not foolish. He doesn't see where you're born or that because you're not some other religion and lump you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying hell. It doesn't work like that. Jesus was discussing this topic with a religious leader of his day, a good guy, raised up in his church called the synagogue. He became a leader. In fact, he became a teacher in Israel. He held to the strictest form of the religious law. We would have thought if anybody was going to heaven, it'd be this guy, Nicodemus, that Jesus was talking to. And yet, Jesus doesn't pat him on the back and say, hey, good job, man. Just keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. He doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you want to get to heaven? You must be born again. Now, I know when I say that term, being born again, a lot of people turn off. They say, ugh. I've seen that in movies, I've seen that on television, it's weird, I read about it on the internet, I, it can't be a good thing, the way they were talking about it. But listen, this is not about what society or pop culture, television, movies, Hollywood, or the internet says. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart, that you've given God all of your life. That simple, it's all or nothing with Jesus. We prove it to you in the book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to his church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic, gross words from the mouth of Jesus. But what's he saying? What's he talking about? Lukewarm. What's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted before God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you better look out. Why do I say look out? Here's why. Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that. Bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven. Denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a second. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. Let's get over that embarrassment today. Jesus went to the cross, beaten bloody, public spectacle for all to see. Now it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart and all of your life in this safe and friendly place? Probably won't even be embarrassed. But the devil's going to try and talk you out of it because he thinks you're dumb. Flesh is going to try and hold you back from it because what will people think? Listen, we think highly of people that are brave and courageous. We're rooting you on. We're excited for you. No one's judging. No one's criticizing. No one's condemning. We're happy for you if you raise your hand. In fact, we've all done it one way or another. At some time or another in our lives, we said yes to Jesus. Now today, it's your turn. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Probably won't even be embarrassed. But even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. Jesus said, you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So today, your call, your choice. Who should raise their hand? You've been running from God instead of two. God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation, come on today, make sure. Who should raise their hand? Well, if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and life, I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. 
You can acknowledge your need for Jesus by simply raising your hand in a moment when I count to three and pop my hands together. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're at, watching my television, the foyer, Love Rock Cafe, or even online all over the world, get ready to get your hands up. God is watching, God sees. If you're on campus, you can tell an usher to come into the church service. If you're online, you can click the blue button or go to our homepage where it says respond to God or know God. Okay, I'm gonna count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high for me. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Where are you at? Six, seven, eight. God bless you guys. Eight wise people already. Nine, 10, 11. Thank you. 12 on this side. Up top, anybody else? 12 wise people on this side. Where are you at? 12 wise people already. 13. Got you right up front there. Thank you. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? 13. They're pointing over here. Anybody else real quick? 13 wise people already. Anybody else that I didn't already see? If I already counted you, you can put your hand down. But I didn't already see. Thank you, 14. God bless you. Up in the family room, 15, 16, two of them. All right, 16 wise people already. Listen, I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. If you need to give God all your heart and all of your life, come on, this is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Anybody else? Come on, come on, come on. You won't be alone. Anybody else real quick? Just pop it up high when I'm looking your direction. Anybody else? About 16 wise people. If that's you. You know you need to do this. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. All right, last call. I'm going to close it up. You're going to miss this. Don't miss this. Don't miss this opportunity. Anybody else? Anybody else? 16 wise people already. If that's you. Thank you, 17. God bless you. Got you. Who else today? Who else today? Anybody else? All right. Let's give the Lord a hand for about 17 wise people. Hallelujah. All right, all 17 of you, or if you're number 18, 19, and 20, ah, should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Not too late. Here's what I want you to do. In a moment, we're all going to stand, give a clap, and a shout, sing a song. As we do that, if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. Get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get your stuff, all right? Get a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front, because we're going to change destinies today. Can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand, you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet us up front right here at the altar. Come on down. Come on down if that's you. You raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. You just come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, they're coming. Let's give the Lord a hand as they come. If that's you, you know you need to give God your heart and life. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Oh, they're still coming. You can come too. You can come too. The cross before the world behind else we need to come? You just come right now. Hallelujah, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, there's room for you up here. Come on down. Come on, come on. Bring your children from the family rooms. Come on. All right, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hey, everybody up front, look up here. Look up here. All right, God's doing something in your life right now. That's good. It's a good thing. You can put a smile on your face. You're headed for heaven. His destination is now your destination. Okay, you can rejoice and be glad about that. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right. See this guy waving at you? This is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is a really good guy. You know, sometimes you go to church and wonder, are they weird? Listen, you already got past me, and I'm about as weird as it gets around here, okay? He's cool. He's going to do three things. First thing he's going to do is lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Then secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature to read about what you've just done with your heart and life and what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, what do I do? Okay, he'll give that to you absolutely free. And then he's going to introduce you to someone we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym helps you get strong? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Let me break it down for you like this. It's a friend. Someone in church will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Okay, it's easy. It's free. He'll describe how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out. Okay? Now, let me make a promise to you guys. Give us one year. One year of your life sitting under the teaching here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center consistently. Okay? Make sure to try and not miss. Get in as much as you can. As you do that at the end of this year and for the rest of your life, you will just be blown away and say, man, I never knew it could be like this. Am I telling the truth, everybody? Yeah. All right. There you go. There you have it. You guys make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right this way. Hallelujah. 
Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.